All right. I think it's a little bit past 5.30. Let's get started. Welcome, folks, to Block Stories Consideration for OpenStack. We're going to share some tips and tricks. Thanks for attending. I believe this is the last session of the day. So we are officially between you and happy hour. <laughs> so we'll try to do our very best to entertain you for the next 40 minutes or so. And if you have any questions or want to share some thoughts, your experiences in the field dealing with OpenStack, feel free to ask and interrupt us anytime. We welcome questions, feedbacks, keep it interactive. And since this is the last session of the day, we're going to do something a little bit different. So instead, instead of having us present, we're going to have you introduce yourself, each and every one of you, starting from the back. <laughs> so once we get done, it's about midnight, so we can all go home. We're not going to do that, all joking aside, but I do want to understand who we are presenting to. So just a simple raise of hand. How many of you in the audience are responsible for building a cloud backed by OpenStack or helping others to build a cloud? Well, quite a lot of you. Good. And then how many of you work for technology vendors? Doesn't have to be storage that build technologies around OpenStack? OK, so we have a pretty good half and half uh, ratio. So that's great. And essentially, the reason why we're here today, myself and Jay, is really to share our experiences dealing with customers and prospects and reseller partners out in the field. There's rising interest, as you all know, on using OpenStack and fit OpenStack into the future IT vision and strategy. So we get a lot of questions from our customers and partners about how to go about leveraging what they have in their infrastructure and build a solid cloud for other people to consume. Let it be internal dev and test organizations or external customers, meaning service providers. Okay? So a little bit about ourselves. My name is Wen Yu. I work as a solutions architect at Nimble Storage. And don't worry, this is not a marketing presentation about Nimble Storage. We will not talk about Nimble Storage at all, just referring to it by the name. And the methods and practices that we give out here are, by the most part, vendor neutral. And we'll definitely call out the ones that are specific to us. Okay? And I work out in the field dealing with customers on an almost day-to-day -day basis. So I hear a lot of challenges that they come across, specifically dealing with OpenStack. So I'm going to share a lot of that, as well as some practical solutions that we have come up with that have helped customers. Okay, and with me today is my partner in crime, Jay Wang from our engineering team. <laughs> and Jay, you want to quickly introduce yourself? I work at Nimble for, uh, as a software engineer and uh, usually with, Quen, uh, with Wen on the cloud area and uh, storage RDK in the cloud area. Yep, so uh, thanks Jay. And I, my job is to figure out the what and the why, what problems we can solve. And Jay is the smart guy behind the scene working on the how, okay? So three things we want to talk about. The first thing is what is happening out in the field with customers thinking about or deploying OpenStack, okay? So we split that into two personas that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and then go over the problems and top of mind things for each of these personas, followed by practical solutions leveraging block storage for OpenStack. And lastly, we do want to share some ideas about what we can do better in the future to make OpenStack Cinder a better project overall in the longer term, okay? Now, when we talk to customers day in and day out, there are two types of people we deal with. The first type is the most common, and these are VMware customers. They have VMware ESX, we send a server, and other suites of product in their data center, serving mostly puppies, pet-type workload. Do you all know the analogy between cattle and puppy? Most of you. OK, so these are mostly puppies that they serve in the organization, whether it be Exchange, SQL, SharePoint, file serving, and whatnot, and other custom applications that support their business critical applications. OK, and a lot of these admins, they know a lot about VMware. They can operate ESX, they can install ESX, they can patch ESX, you name it. They know a lot about Windows because most of their workloads are Windows. And these are not your typical DevOps guys that know Chef and Puppet or Cobbler. They know a thing or two about PowerShell, but to make themselves more competitive in this cloud landscape, they are thinking about OpenStack. So this is not really your normal top-down approach where the CIO or CTO gave direction to these folks to think about OpenStack. These are folks that are thinking about OpenStack themselves to see if they could add value to the organization by having a self-service portal like Horizon for developer and test team to orchestrate the provisioning of virtual machines, okay? 
So we get a lot of questions from these folks about, oh, so how do I get started with OpenStack? We try DevStack, it's great. It's not really doing much of real workload. What can we do next? And keep in mind, these, most of these folks don't really have an IT budget to go out and acquire some commodity servers to kickstart their OpenStack deployment, nor do they have the budget to allocate for system integrators to come in and help them customize their cloud like other larger companies, okay? So we actually propose a solution for them to leverage what they have in their environment and get started with OpenStack. So I'll go over that in a little bit. And the second set of persona, and so the top of mind things for these folks are, can I deploy OpenStack with an easy button? And can I roll back to a specific point in time if I screw up? Right? Keep in mind, these folks may not have a lot of experience with CLIs and config files, cinder.com, nova.com. Right? So they have to muck around with stuff day in and day out. And they do want to capture a specific point in time where everything is working fine. And they have the ability to go back should they have to. Okay? And second set of persona is the more experienced folks. Right? These are more like architects. They come from DevOps background. They know Chef Puppet, Cobbler, all right? They use Cobbler in conjunction with Puppet, for example, to instantiate environments, push out applications, and they support a lot of the cattle-type workloads in conjunction with the puppies, right? The applications that are born in the cloud and more or less stateless in nature, okay? And these folks have both the JBots, local JBots attached to servers that they acquire, as well as SAN arrays. So we do get a lot of questions, of, oh, should I junk the local JBots and not use them? Absolutely not, why not? You have them, why not use them and have a tier model, okay? So we'll go over some of the key questions that they have in mind. And of course, these folks, the top of mind thing for them is to prevent people from going to AWS, right? In other words, offer better service than elastic block storage, okay? So let's talk about how these folks go about architecting their environment to compete with Amazon. All right, starting with the easy one, right? These are the easy guys to deal with, right? These guys know vSphere day in and day out. And they have a SAN that they purchase to run ESX with VMBFS volume, all right? A lot of you know, how many of you know ESX? All right, so I'm not speaking to an audience that don't know ESX, that's good. All right, so what we propose to them is, instead of starting with a workstation dev stack VM that doesn't really run anything useful, why not just leverage your dev and test environment, your ESX cluster that is serving dev and test workload, backed by shared storage. A lot of times when we propose this, people said, oh yeah, I do have some resource pools that I can create in my ESX cluster to house a few VMs that run as controllers. As you might know, if you don't have like thousands of virtual machine instances, you don't need a whole lot of CPU or memory resources, right? Controllers are pretty lightweight in OpenStack, and also they have some headroom as well as capacity in their shared storage, in this case, Nimble. And what we present to them is really you can carve out a sub-resource pool under your ESX cluster, and then use, you can deploy a virtual machine. A lot of these guys know how to click and create a new VM and place the VMDK on the VMFS volumes. It's pretty straightforward. Install send OS, and what we typically recommend is uh, Red Hat OpenStack, Audio. You guys use Audio before? Okay, it's a pretty good tool to get started, and just a three command. Right? You get the RPM for OpenStack, you get PackStack, and then you do a PackStack all in one. So it installs all the services that are needed for your OpenStack cloud meaning Horizon, Nova, Cinder, Volume, Cinder Scheduler, API, Solometer, you name it, everything in one VM, okay? And the next question you might ask is, oh, how the hell do I run VMs within ESX VM, right? So it's nested virtualization. And as you might know, the popular choice for OpenStack hypervisor is KVM, and a lot of questions come up is, oh, so I have the CentOS VM, great, how do I run KVM inside of it? So other instances can run on top of it. So it's pretty straightforward, very easy to do. ESX.com file, you just add the command option call uh, VHV equals enable. Uh, don't worry about taking notes, we have it in the notes for this slide. If you can't wait to get it, we can send you a copy, okay? And then in the virtual machine itself, the CentOS, you can just add a couple of command options to control the behavior of the virtual machine monitor, and off you go. So you can have a Nova service running inside of a virtual machine inside ESX. 
It's like the inception of virtualization. All right? And if you have a beefy enough box, this actually works pretty well. You can have you know, tens or twenties of virtual machines running. Now, you get OpenStack running, you, you're ready to show your manager the horizon view of things where, can, where people can use self-service orchestration. The next thing to do is you know, play around with settings, you know, deploy additional nodes, Nova nodes, or cinder volume nodes. And if you happen to screw up, let's be honest here, I screw up many times when I install OpenStack, when I play with advanced parameters, I cause Nova and Cinder to have segmentation faults where I can't log into Horizon. So what do we do then? It's pretty straightforward. If you have some capacity in your SAN array, make sure these controller nodes and the MySQL database runs inside a VMFS volume. It could be the same volume or separate volumes. The key thing to keep in mind is you want a point of consistency across both the controllers as well as the MySQL database. So different SAN vendors call it differently. So for us, we call it a volume collection. Some of them call it a consistency group. What that really means is when you initiate a snapshot from the SAN, it captures all of the volumes should you have separate volumes, okay? So take snapshots every point of the way, right? Snapshot when you, after you install the CentOS VM or uh, Ubuntu, okay? Take a snapshot after you did the Packstack installation of all-in-one, right? Take a snapshot before you muck around with your cinder.conf. Very helpful, and to recover, very straightforward. What do you do? You power off the controller VM, and then you go into the SAN, a lot of SAN vendors nowadays have vCenter plugin in vSphere already. So you simply go into the plugin or the SAN management interface, revert to a snapshot. Usually this takes the volume offline. And then you bring the volume back online. You go into ESX, you rescan, and you power on your controller again. You're good to go. And you can even try to do a RM minus RF on the controller node and see what happens and revert back to operational state. So this has helped a lot of our customers tremendously when they want to think about OpenStack. So a question to you all is, is this relevant to you and your end users? Do you think they might find it useful? Okay, cool. And really, if you get more advanced in this setup, you can easily expand out to run KVM on physical boxes by changing the answer.txt file and deploy another Nova node so you don't have to have this nested virtualization thing that is totally unsupported. Okay? Yeah. Any questions so far? Okay, cool, let's move on. So this is the easier one to deal with when we come across these type of questions. Now, let's get into the advanced users. These are namely service providers, these are bigger organizations that have some DevOps presence. So they do have some architects that understand DevOps. So a lot of times what these guys think about is how do I have the best of both worlds using both local JBots as well as my shared storage that I pay a bit more money for compared to the JBots on the servers? How do I add differentiated value for my consumers? Let it be internal dev and test environments or external consumers of my cloud that is backed by OpenStack. And of course, gold, silver, bronze, service tiering. In these environments, what we often get asked is, number one, how do I leverage both local JBot as well as shared storage? Answer is very simple from a high level, but we'll dive into the weeds, okay, don't worry, is to leverage the multi-backend Cinder feature that was introduced back in Grizzly release. And the second one is traffic isolation. For bigger jobs, they have the storage array dissected in a few ways with AO2.1Q VLAN trunking. So they do want to dictate the dev team going to this specific interface so they can have higher level quality of service as well as metering and measurement of who uses what, when, and how much. And they do want to have the ability to separate out who has access to what interface on the storage controller going from Nova, okay? And the next thing is, can one add additional services in addition to a number of IOPS I can have, some capacity, some performance? Can I do more at the instance level so people feel good about paying for premium highest level of service, All right? This is something that Amazon doesn't have, EBS doesn't have any sort of multi pathing I could be wrong, they might have added it already, but this is what people can do, and we'll show you how. And last but not least, is, this is a storage offload operation. Are you guys familiar with the ReStorage API for array integration, VAI? 
Okay, some of you. So the ability to offload certain operations that are pretty efficient from storage perspective. When I say storage, meaning shared storage, okay? And were you all in the previous session where the folk, folks from eBay and PayPal? So we'll complement that. They talk a lot about the benefits as well as the, the what. So we're gonna show you the how, okay? So the first three ask could be easily complemented with a multi-cinder backend. With the next one, enable through glance, boot from volume, clone from snapshot. We'll show you a screenshot of what to do when you have this implementation. Now with a reference model like this, this is exactly what one of our service provider customers has done in their OpenStack cloud. Unfortunately, I don't have permission to share the name. Once I do, you can expect a blueprint from us on how exactly they did it. Okay, so these folks, they have a model in which they order servers, the x86 servers with local JBots. Not a whole lot of them, but enough capacity not to put to waste. And they do have a shared storage array from us. So there's, there are two types of storage here, and you could certainly create three tiers of offering here. One of which is to have LVM on top of a VG created based on the local JBot. You don't have to have RAID configuration if that's your lowest tier. So the people that use this type of storage, they most oftentimes have Chef and Puppet to instantiate the VM when they go down. Right? If the server dies, you lose the local JBot, then you could certainly instantiate it in an automated fashion. So snapshots and replication, those are not very important in this, in this tier of service at least. Okay, and it's pretty native, built in, you could easily configure it, and we'll show you an example as well. And the second tier up is, we often get asked, so I can, I can use JBot to back a LVM through Cinder. Can I use a shared storage volume from the array and have LVM back in it? Absolutely, very simple to do, and you'll see in the example that we'll show you. And last but not least, the highest tier of offering is the per instance level mapping. Each instance could boot from a Cinder volume from the array, and then the snapshot and cloning operations are all offloaded to the array. So no more copying like Amazon EBS. You take a snapshot, you copy to S3, and God knows when you can restore that thing over the network that has no guarantee. So this is very different. It is offloaded to the array. Some storage vendors have pretty efficient algorithms to do redirect on write, for example, instead of copying the data block by block like some vendors do we can copy the data just by manipulating the pointer of the metadata for these volumes, okay? And some benefits of this model is the lowest tier is cost effective. You can have the lowest tier of offering to attract customers to come in. The next tier up is you have higher performance. Nowadays with most storage vendors, legacy or not, they have some flash optimization, okay? So typically you get better performance out of the sheer storage tier. And you can configure multi-pathing at this layer. So it's transparent to the instances. If you want to provide more value add to the cloud users, then you can certainly advertise this as, oh, in, in addition to more capacity, faster performance, you get multi-pathing for your instances if you use this tier. And last but not least, the highest tier offering, you have multi-pathing at the instance level. You have traffic isolation, like I mentioned based on what subnet of what VLAN is orchestrated by each and every instance. And last but not least, with this, you can have snapshot and clone offload through Glance. Having said all of that, this is an example of how you would go about doing it. So this is what the synod.conf look like. And uh, Jay reminded me earlier, I actually exposed the <laughs> common password that we use in our environment. <laughs> <laughs> So I changed it before the presentation. Thanks, Jay. What's the, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take out that little gray box. I'll move it out so you can copy it. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> You're right. Okay, so, so at the top, is, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the, the, the option enable backend is already built in in syn.com, so you don't have to write it on your own. Just uncomment that out, and then define the different backends that you have. And whatever backend you put up here, it better match with the bracket down here. Otherwise, you're gonna blow up, right? So you, you won't be able to get anything done. So it, within each bracket, you just define for LVM, local JBot LVM, just match up the name of the volume group that you created based on your JBots attached to the servers. 
Okay? And the driver, of course, is the LVM iSCSI driver that's built into OpenStack. And the backend name is, you want to give it a meaningful name that matches what you have up there as backends. Okay? And this is the configuration parameter for our Cinder driver. If you work with a SAN vendor that integrates with OpenStack through Cinder, you're going to get this information from them. Okay? Each one is unique. And then make sure you point to the driver. Right, the issue match. And then last but not least, so this is what we did with a VG backed by a shared storage volume. You just present the volume to your Cinder volume node. And then you create a meaningful name so you know what it is. And then you just put the name up here. That's it. And then define a backend for it. Okay? So far, so good? Ah, good question. So the question was, uh, what if I want to do service level offering based on the storage backend, meaning how many IOPS I can guarantee from the storage backend? That is one of the methods in which I've seen people implement. And for us, we are building the foundation in which we could apply services in the storage layer. So that is one model that could work, meaning the simple fashion of, so what's my number of shares? Similar to DRS in vSphere, you can have this number of IOPS, this is your ceiling, this is the minimum, this is the guarantee, and this is the burst. So that, that model works as well. So yeah, by all means, if that's what you want to do, certainly you can do that. But this is really to leverage the best of both worlds, to have local chatbots as well as shared storage in the back end. Okay. Great question. Any other questions? OK, so you know, all, all know how to do this, right? And then feel free to copy and paste this thing. One thing I ran into is, uh, I'm not sure if folks in the audience have run into this before, is I started out with the OpenStack deployment, deployed my controller nodes, got my Cinder volume server up and running. I just didn't bother with types. Right? So I just started adding my, my Nimble driver under the default tab. And I started going wild and creating all these instances with, from volume. and. Stuff like that. And then later on, I figure, oh, might as well start with the tier model. Let me try some LVM stuff. And guess what? It didn't work. So Cinder service could not start. I'm not sure if that's a bug. So my recommendation to you is always start with a type, even though you only have one type. So in the future, if you want to add type, you can just expand this back end and add some bracket that represents the other type that you want to define for the end users. And off you go. Okay. All right. So that's the example. So before we get into the multi-pathing advanced stuff at the KVM layer, we will talk about the snapshot and clone offload through Glance. So if you attended the previous session, this is essentially how you do it. So you have your cloud image. This could be an image from Ubuntu or Red Hat that you download from the repository. This could be a VMDK or ISO file, a VMDK that you upload into Glance. They, it does like a block by block copying. And you have the choice as the end consumer of OpenStack to deploy the instance and boot off the instance from a SAN volume. So what you have to do is in the launch instance within Horizon, you basically select instance boot source. You can boot from an image which creates a new volume. So it does a block by block copying of the image into the SAN volume in which you can boot in the future, okay? And then if you have a multi backend sender approach implementation, no problem. You could still have dictation of who deploys instances over what type of storage. To do that, the trick is you want to create the volume first before you allow the people to go into instance to launch the instance. Because in, within this tab, there's no way for you to tell OpenStack what type of volume to create. So that's something we would like to propose in the summit so people have the flexibility without having to go into here to create the volume first and then have the instance boot from this volume. Okay? So if you take a snapshot of this thing, so the beauty of the Cinder driver implementation is Notice, if you do a Cinder volume and you want to take a snapshot of the volume from the volumes tab, guess what? You can't. It's attached to something. So you can't take a snapshot. But with this approach, you can. You go into the instance and you take create snapshot. If you, it, it doesn't matter whether this 
instance has external volumes attached or not, it will take, it will take a snapshot. Let's say you, you have an instance booting off a cinder volume from shared storage, you could attach another volume to the VM. When you hit that snapshot, create snapshot button, you'll create an array-based snapshot for both the volumes that are attached to the instance while the virtual machine is running. Okay? So that's one advantage of using this approach and give people warm and fuzzy about using your most expensive tier of storage. Okay? And of course, the cloning of this is offloaded. In our implementation, we don't do block by block copying. Should you want to take a snapshot of an instance and deploy hundreds, if not thousands, of clones off of it, instead of copying the volume block by block, we simply manipulate the pointer in our file system, which represents that volume, and give you writable snapshots. Okay, so you can have no data, yeah, no data duplications. There's no need for dedu. A 400 gig volume, you clone it, it takes a few bytes of metadata, and that's it. So this is perfect use case for a deaf and test environment where you have a two terabyte or petabyte database that you want your developers to write code against. Right? When you test, you want to test production level data. So this makes it easier without having to copy those things. Which brings another challenge that we run into and we're hoping to implement this in the future is right now we have these volumes on the array side serving, let's say, physical databases or virtualized SQL databases running on VMware. There's no easy way to import that big volume into OpenStack and have OpenStack recognize that as a cinder volume. And what we want to do, there's a blueprint exists in the uh, uh, launch pad is the import-export of volume, meaning you take this piece of volume and change the metadata so OpenStack understands it. So you don't have to do a copy into glands and then from glands into a volume, which is 2x the copy, which is ultimately very redundant and inefficient. And question to you all is, would that be useful if we implement this and share with the community? Okay, a few hands, okay, cool. All right, and that's pretty much it in terms of snapshot, offload, clones, et cetera. And now, moving on to the more fun stuff, which is multi-pathing. And how many of you want to hear about the multi-pathing at the ESX layer? Okay, so we spend a little bit of time. Uh, I saw a few hands back there. In the ESX layer, should you use the Nova driver for vCenter? and you have a dedicated ESX cluster, very straightforward. If you use a storage array that is certified with VMware, hopefully you are, chances are it works with the native multi-pathing plugin within the VM kernel storage stack, NMP. So they have two plugins. One is called the SAPI, storage array type plugin, and the other is called PSP, path selection plugin. So both work hand in hand. One is responsible for monitoring the health of all the available paths you have for your environment. The other is really making sure to pick the best available path to issue I.O. So if you use a Nova driver for vCenter with ESX, you essentially dedicate your ESX cluster as the Nova node, meaning your virtual machine instances will run on ESX. So you inherit the benefits of HA, DRS, vMotion, all of those things will work. And the multi-pathing is underneath the cover, okay? So that's pretty much it. You want to make sure you have a storage array that supports ESX. And if you use iSCSI, then you want to make sure you bind the software iSCSI initiator with all of the available interfaces that you dedicate for VM kernel iSCSI traffic. Pretty easy to do. And now on the KVM side, and we'll have my smarter half, Jay, to explain the behind the scene on how to do multi-pathing and OpenStack with KVM. Take it away, Jay. Hey, thanks, Wayne. Um, so, Wayne briefly mentioned about how, open, how, how ESX is done with multipathing. So the question is actually why we need multipathing at all. Um, first is performance, right? So let's say you have uh, one gig link on your host or on your array, and basically you saturate the link, then multipathing actually can provide you uh, better performance because you can create another path to another link on the storage or on the host. So definitely will go up by performance. And in addition to that, if you have, let's say you have 10 gig link, I never saturated the link, why I need multi-pathing. And then there's the iSCSI, um, uh, if you're using open iSCSI, the default 
efficacy session has 32 uh, QDAP limits. So if you create, create more link, actually you uh, increase your performance. And let's say you don't have uh, application that need that much performance, why I need multipathing. But maybe you don't have it now, but there may be a burst or I.O. request burst um, or a period of time you need high I.O. and that actually can help you a lot. And another main reason is uh, also low balancing, right? Um, Multipathing in SCSI layer, you actually have low balancing algorithm per line. You, have, you can use run robin or QDAP, uh, different kind of low balancing algorithm. Another um, obvious reason is redundancy, right? If you only have one path to your array and that path is down, then basically you lost connection to your array. Um, so multipathing is very useful in this case. So when mentioned about how it get done on ESX, uh, is basically you have to enable, um, um, there's a default uh, multipathing, uh, uh, depends on your type, your SAP type, and then they assign a default PSP for you. And you can change to default, uh, from default to the, the type or the plugin that you want to use. And for LVM, if you configure uh, LVM backend, then basically your multipathing is configured with your multipathing device. Let's say you're using Linux or CentOS, then you have to install multipathing package. And when you uh, uh, create, do PV create, then you have to make sure that you create uh, the device on the multipath device. And if you're using single share storage, and you have to enable Nova, so there's a multipath, uh, configuration in nova.conf, you have to make it to true. So Nova, when you attach a volume to a VM, Nova will automatically create session to the target. Uh, depends on how many target that backend return. So their different storage has different design. Some storage return all their data IPs. When they return all their data IPs, Nova actually will make individual connection to all the target IPs, so you have multipathing. But if vendor only return one data IP, which is virtual data IP, and then they redirect in the back, then you have to uh, do a little bit tweaking. Either you set the NR sessions to create default sessions for the target, or you have to manually, manually create some sessions. And this is how to, we have more details, uh, steps on how to enable multipathing, but uh, this is just, uh, broad high level steps. First you have to ins install device mapper multipath on CentOS Red Hat. And for Ubuntu you install multipath tools. After that, each vendor has its own recommendation on how you configure multipathing. Then you have to copy and paste that uh, recommendation to uh, multipath.com. And uh, in Nova you have to enable this libvirt SCSI. iSCSI uses multipath to true. And after that, when you attach a volume from Cinder to a VM or an instance, you'll see multipath actually get created. And, and by default, you use all the path. And actually, it depends on how you set up multipath.conf. If you use Ron Robin then, or LeaseQDAP or the algorithm, then you'll start using all the path and based on the algorithm. And uh, just to show you that we're not lying about detail steps, we, uh, <laughs> we have the step-by-step. -step down with the notes. So if you get a copy of the slide, feel free to try it out. And the, uh, Jay mentioned the NR sessions. That's useful if you have a, a, an iSCSI array that returns a single iSCSI discovery target. Yes. So you can modify the number of sessions and connections you want, as opposed to the other implementations where they return every possible discovery target. So something to keep in mind, depending on what iSCSI solution you have, be sure to check with your vendor of choice on that one. Yeah. Um, okay, the next topic we want to talk about is backup and restore. And today, one option if you want to do backup is from Cinder and you backup to Swift or S3. And then it's basically a whole volume backup. And when you backup, you have to consider compression, dedupe, encryption, and maybe incremental backup. And that probably will be controlled by if you have a backup software and they can do incremental for you. And then maybe do compression, D2 encryption for you. Or you're using S3 and actually they have some uh, uh, capability built in. But 
Um, definitely is one way to do it, but restore can take time and may be costly if you're using S3. And if you also you have to consider uh, the cost of backup software. So one way using your existing shared storage is that you can simply use snapshot and replication for your backup. So you can take as many snapshots as you want and you can actually set up schedules on your snapshots or, um, or your volume, right? Uh, or your consistency group in a way. And once you set up a schedule that actually do the backup for you and if your backend storage provide replication, and you can also set up replication. So not only you have your backup strategy, you also have your DR. And that's also helpful if, let's say, you have multi-site development and app, right? And then uh, you do 24 hours development. You develop in um, San Jose uh, in the morning. And then you can transfer the data by replication to uh, Hong Kong, for example, for, for uh, the rest of the time for development. So that's another use case. Um, to use to take advantage of your share, share storage, and for restore and scale, it's also pretty easy in a, a share storage. If there's because there's still there are already um, technology building for restore, you simply from a snapshot you make a clone, and you can install, or you can simply revert uh, your volume from your snapshot. So recovery is also very fast and straightforward. Um, that's how you can also use your backend storage technology to do your backup and restore. I'll have when to address some okay. ideas for the future. Okay, all right, thanks Jay. Yeah. Well, before we get into uh, future ideas, I uh, want to make sure we can address all your questions. And I know we are right at the dot 610. I want to make sure we can address any questions, burning questions you might have. Feel free to ask. Yeah, I'll make sure I understand your question. So uh, you wanted us to address the use case where you have VMFS data store yeah. and the usage of RDM in this Right, so context? In, uh, is your solution dealing with, your, uh, with the RDM? Uh -huh. Like God is connected directly? Yeah. Like uh, manipulating the right. and everything right. on the storage devices or is uh, manipulating the VMFS store? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Now. In regards to RDM, I don't believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe the current VMDK driver from VMware works with RDM. I think it's mainly VMDKs that they create. So for RDMs, uh, I, I'm not sure how you would yeah, manipulate you that. You present that as a raw disk to your VMDSXI okay. and you can directly mount it on your machine. Oh, okay, so that works. Okay, that's good to know. So if you present an RDM directly to an instance, so apparently that works as well. So that's something we should uh, give it a try. And another similar use case is a lot of people do a direct iSCSI mounting within the virtual machine instance. So that works in OpenStack as well. You just want to make sure you have the right software iSCSI initiator. You present the target, and you want to add that IQN to your storage array so it knows that instance wants to directly mount your volume. So that works as well, but it's really the puppet, uh, puppy approach, I'm sorry, puppy approach where you have to take extra care of this guy to make sure you mount the right volume. And it could be useful if you know how to automate at the virtual machine layer. Great question. Any other ones? Talking okay, about the Cinder shared storage, do you mean that multiple uh, instances can share the same storage, or is the storage shared below the Cinder? Okay, good question. The question was when we talk about the Cinder driver with volume in the storage backend, can multiple instances mount the exact same volume like ESX does with VMFS? The answer is no, it's really one to one mapping. I believe there's a blueprint talking about multi attach where you can have multiple instances attaching the same underlying physical volume. So that's something to, I, to look yeah. out for. <laughs> Good question. So do we support live migration? We, so let me uh, phrase it that way. So if you have a way to have the 
Shan stores volume share across instances within KVM, then yes. But we haven't tried that myself. Honestly, the people that we deal with, their SLA is really not five nines at this point for depth and test. So they could suffer an outage on the Cinder volume node and leverage cobbler and puppet to instantiate another Cinder volume instance, present the Cinder LVM behind the scene, and off they go. So, great question. And I think you had a follow on question. No, no. no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. A second. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. No, I was asking what was the main use case to have uh, share uh, storage? I know some clustering uh, environment you may have a uh, requirement for right, the right, share storage. Okay. Yeah. What would the best instances would like to go to the same storage? Okay, yeah. so the use case, if I understand correctly, is you have a database instance where you want multiple virtual machines to have different databases on the same instance. Is that correct? Differently? Uh, yeah, multiple database instances running on different VMs, but they all go to the same. Oh, system. okay, very, yeah. very much like the VMFS model. Traditional uh, okay. cluster environments. Okay. The yeah, good point. Yeah. I, I think right now uh, the it's landscape is to, to get um, HA for shared storage, let's say through LVM or through this model with the Cinder driver, uh, you would have to do like pacemaker and also some configuration on the other node in the head for two node configuration. It's a bit complicated, so if we can inherit this within Cinder, it would make life a lot easier. Would you agree? I don't know. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Well, hopefully, this is useful and the future ideas. We probably presented in the uh, summit, the design summit. So if you have questions that you want to talk to us about, feel free to come up. Thank you. All right. Thank you.